Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out, and in the video today, we're looking at why pomp and circumstance is played at graduations. And just before we get started, I will say that this video is US specific. Every year, hundreds of thousands of students march across the stage in a gown and a squared hat to receive a piece of paper that says they've completed a particular phase in their education. This school graduation will undoubtedly be marked by cheering proud adults and particularly in North America, as I mentioned, the playing of the seminal marching tune Pomp and Circumstance March No. 1. So, well, why is Pomp and Circumstance played at seemingly every graduation? Well, we should probably kick things off by discussing the name itself, Pomp and Circumstance. This is simply a phrase for ceremony or display of splendor or of stateliness. It comes from the Latin pompa, meaning procession, and circumstantia, meaning standing around. A procession of standing around doesn't make much sense until one follows the evolution of the meaning of circumstantia. In the 13th century, the word was used in reference to a particular detail, matter of small consequence. But a century later, in the 1300s, somehow it literally reversed its meaning to be defined as something of great importance or accomplishment. Like so many other phrases, the credit for the first to coin this one is generally given to William Shakespeare, though in many cases it is thought he was just using existing phrases that we simply don't have earlier surviving examples of today. Day. Whatever the case, in Act 3, Scene 3 of his 1604 play, Othello, the title character notes, Farewell thy neighing steed and the shrill trump, the spirit-stirring drum, the ear-piecing fife, the royal banner, and all quality, pride, pomp, and circumstance of glorious war. From there, the phrase seemed to take on an almost sarcastic quality, often used as a way to make fun or point to the belief that someone or something thinks of themselves as overly important. Flash forward three centuries later to 1901, and one Edward Elgar had already made a name for himself as one of the premier English musical composers of his day. Despite this, as with so many musicians and artists before him, Elgar was struggling financially, unable to translate critically acclaimed works into money-making successes. Knowing that people love a good military march, though, he composed two of what would end up being five marches that he called Pomp and Circumstance pulling the title from that line in Othello. As for the most famous of these marches, March No. 1, legend has it that Elgar told a friend, Dora Penny, that I've got a tune that will knock him, knock him flat. A tune like that comes once in a lifetime. Whether he actually said this or not, Pomp and Circumstance March No. 1 in D was first performed on October 19, 1901 by the Liverpool Orchestral Society. This debut performance was reportedly met with a standing ovation, which was nothing compared to when it was played three days later in London. After the first go around, the ecstatic audience would not let the rest of the concert go until the tune was played two more times. And do note that this sort of non passive audience totally used to be the norm even during symphonies, contrary to what generally happens at such events today. If you want to learn more about that, we actually discuss it at length in the first ever episode of our podcast called The Brain Food Show. The episode's called Throwing Tomatoes. You can find it on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. All right. With that plug out of the way, this event was, according to the London Performances conductor Henry J. Wood, the first time in that particular theatre's history that a double encore was ever done. In November of that year, Elgar was approached by famed English contralto Clara Butt, who asked him to compose a finale for her performance with a full chorus at the crowning of King Edward VII later that summer. Sparing himself some extra work, Elgar used the very same march that he had composed that was such a big hit. He did add some lyrics to it thanks to a poet called Arthur Christopher Benson. It was given the name Land of Hope and Glory. Benson's lyrics extol the virtues of the British crown and empire. The march, coupled with lyrics and butt singing, was all set to premiere on June the 30th at King Edward VII's coronation, but the king fell ill and the ceremony was delayed until August the 9th. In the meantime, Elgar put together four more marches and produced sellable versions of them. By August, he was actually already making pretty good money off this. When it was finally played at the coronation of the new king and queen, Elgar was on his way to making a fortune. Thanks to the music's prominence in the coronation, Elgar became internationally 
famous. Fairly quickly, in part because of its use at the coronation of the king and queen, the march became immensely popular with American orchestras, particularly played with great frequency in Chicago. Coming back around to why pomp and circumstances played during graduation ceremonies in 1905, Elgar was invited to the United States by a friend, professor of music Samuel Sanford, to receive an honorary degree from Yale University. Hailed as England's foremost musician, he outshone the 12 others who were also receiving honorary degrees from the revered American University. Upon completion of the ceremony, the entire group left the stage to the tune of Pomp and Circumstance March No. 1 in honor of Elgar. This is the first known time that the tune was played at a graduation. The uplifting song was noted by other colleges and then played at their graduations, including at Princeton in 1907 and the University of Chicago in 1908. According to the Elgar Research Center, it was the 1920s when Pomp and Circumstance became the norm at college graduation all across the United States, though it's unclear when it shifted from being a recessional to a processional entering song. Today, the lyrical version of the march, Land of Hope and Glory, is one of England's most famous songs, even considered by some to be something of a second national anthem. In the United States, the March Sans lyrics is also played thousands of times a year while students march down the aisles in anticipation of receiving their diplomas. So I really hope you enjoyed that video and don't forget to subscribe to this channel for brand new videos every day of the week. Also, I've got another channel. It's called Biographics. It's biographies of notable people from the present day as well as history from Elon Musk to Osama bin Laden. You can check it out through the icon on the screen now. But if you want to watch something else right now, check out another Today I Found Out video or a Biographics video over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.